Okay. Okay. Hello. 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 Um, today is February 6th, 2023, and this is Film Roundtable. My name is Erin Weil. I am one of the co-founders. Um, we have a really fun, fun, fun talk tonight with um, artist Terrence Nance and um, Tamir Muhammad, and old, both both good friends of mine. And um, Tamir is a producer and artist, and he is the founder of Populous, which is an entertainment company that makes pop culture for the populace. Um, he's the executive producer of Random Acts of Flyness, which he did with Terrence um, season one and season two for HBO. So we are going to chat with them tonight and and just hear about how they created this um, second season of beautiful visual um, ecstasy. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful show. Um, yeah. So welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for joining us on Monday evening. <laughs> Thanks and you both me. have been on before, so super nice to have you back. Um, yeah, so I think uh, we're going to start off. Um, I just was reflecting from watching the season that I'm not quite sure that I have um, seen visual art like this uh, before, movie, TV show, installations, whatnot, where I really feel that... Um, Terrence, it was, it was, he spoke his truth all the way through. Like it doesn't feel like he's wavered from his vision. Um, and it might be, I might feel that way because I know him. Um, but I also really want to hear how he was able to stay so focused and not got, get pulled away from the collaboration aspect, because that is one thing about Terrence is he's all about the collaboration and the community and everybody working together. And it's really beautiful that um, he was able to walk away with such probably a beautiful collaboration of folks um, all feeling in alignment with what he was doing. And it really, really, really feeling like him. So I would love to hear a bit about that and how he was able to, um, you know, move through that process. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for that good question. And just like watching the show with that, you know, level of care, you know, to, to like bring that observation to it. I think it is like a both and in the sense that when I watch it and as we were making it, you know, it's very much a you know unmitigated Terrence, you know what I mean? It's like exactly what came through, you know, my own spiritual guidance to make and to channel through. And it is that it's it's a, it's a laser in that way, you know, kind of went from point A to point B without even there being time, you know, to like interrupt its flow. And um it it only is what it is because of Tamir, you know, because of um, all the directors on the show and all the writers on the show, you know, um, Duatama, Jen, um, Andy, Naima, you know, Mariama, my brother Nelson, you know, list goes on and on, collaborators, collaborators. It, it's, it is only what it is as a story, um, you know, about a Liberian American person and myself as African American because of the people who were in the room, because of, you know, the West African women in the room, for instance, um, you know, it's only a relationship story in a lot of ways because of something Tamir said to me on season one <laughs> after the pilot. I don't know if you remember this, but you were like, you know what you need to make a segment about when you get home to your lady and you just work real hard and she want to take you to task or something. Like, what do you do? <laughs> you said something like that. <laughs> and that was like a prompt for, that's that was the big inspiration for the Naj and Terrence like landing on the roof. And you just got out of an altercation with the police, and you got to like bring a, a sweetness and softness to your lady in a certain moment. And that, you know, just what that is. And so, like, you know, his idea there, his experience, you know, dictated what it is. And you know, so it's both like deeply inside of me, deeply from and through me, and a hundred percent from everybody, you know? Um, and 
I think that there is um, just to kind of speak to how it becomes possible for you know that level of, as you said, just sort of um, clarity and focus. You know, not being distracted by you know any ideas or other voices that might distract it. You know, and pull it off course. Um, you know, it's only about committing to a spiritual practice. Uh, maybe I should say a, a, a practice of making the show that centralizes a relationship with the spirit world so that the thing that's coming out um, has another entity or other entities who I can go to to make decisions, you know, <laughs> and, and see if like something, a note, should resonate or should be included or um, even see if something that's coming up in me, uh, you know, should be included or ignored. Um, and I think that cultivating discernment is like a lot of it, you know, Co cultivating discernment in terms of, you know, when an idea comes up to do, how aligned is it with the prayer of the show? You know, specifically if this show this season, you know, is is about how Black people navigate their archetypes, what they're born with, you know, in order to be in connection, to be in some sort of possibility of pushing the needle towards their own liberation. If that's the prayer, you know, does this particular idea help or hurt that prayer? You know what I mean? Like, ultimately, you know, it's just cultivating discernment by, um, making that decision over and over again, just like anything else is a practice. So, you know, that's that's kind of what it's been for me. And I think like working with Tamir, and that's kind of what one question I would even have for you is, you know, as we've been on this journey, you know, you've had to, a, a lot of what you have to do is just process a lot of information. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And like a lot of people's ideas, a lot of people's agendas, and, you know, choose what to act on and how to act. So I do kind of wonder like how you stay focused as well, you know, given all the voices that are coming into the process for you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it goes a lot to what you talk about relationships. You know, I value them and not only just my relationship with you, you know, no one could replace the almost 15 years now that we have been able to be in such a rhythm that everything that you work on is personal for me as well. You know, um, but I think it's also my relationship to myself. You know, I know who I am and I know what I set out to do when I first, you know, sort of started out. I mean, Erin right here can tell you she was there from the beginning when I started my journey and was instrumental and in supporting it. Right. Um, and so when I build off of that, I'm also very fortunate that I have such a great relationship with HBO that there is a trust, I think, amongst myself, you, and HBO, for example, that makes it much easier for me to navigate and to negotiate what is needed. Because I also know that at the end of the day, especially with a network like HBO, we all at the end of the day want something that's made, something that we can stand behind. And it's very challenging to, sometimes people just want to get it done. And that idea of getting it done is needed. That's, that's, that's the way to weed out who is capable of making and who is not. But in that idea of getting it done, if not careful, you can sacrifice a lot. And so I'm also just very conscious of, for some artists, it's not just about hitting the marks. It's also about hitting, as you always talk about, speaking to the heart and not so much just here. And so if you back back and you understand that, yes, you have the marks you have to hit, but you got to negotiate enough bandwidth and space within that so that you can really get at the heart. And that's the challenge, right? And so I'm always trying to protect that to leave room that no one walks away feeling frustrated or feeling like it hasn't been accomplished, but that the heart doesn't get sacrificed at the end of the day. Does that, does that answer it? And so a lot of times I go in with the decision of saying, you know, hey, Terrence, X, Y, Z is happening. Here's the larger macro picture. But when we boil it down, 
how is this going to get in our way of being able to have the room to explore the heart, you know, of what the show is, you know, and to your point, there are a lot of people outside of us in HBO, you know, or any person in the industry that have agendas, um, you know, that we want to get accomplished. And so I pride myself on kind of being the connector to sort of understand that. And I think every creative needs someone who can hear it, receive it, and then know what to do with it. Um, it's just a needed part of the process because less left to our own devices, you know, whether it's the artist, a producer, or say the network, we're only going to go after what we individually want. And so for me, it's a it's a bit of a, a, a sort of partnership. And again, whether it's with you or whoever, I always look at it that way and try my hardest to maintain that sort of ethos going into it. Yeah, I mean it's a funny thing because like, so everybody always asks me like, like how is it possible that, like when they watched the, especially the second season, I would say, first season two was the second season. There's like a real like, oh, they just let you do whatever you want to do. You just like fucking do it, whatever, you know what I mean? And I'm like, if only you knew, like <laughs> that's, not, that's not the dynamic on any level. Um, you know, and to to get to something that feels free, um, or maybe more so that feels like outside of the acceptable sort of storytelling language of contemporary movies and TV, you know, which is all the things that that is, you know, part of the point of the show is to like make a new language, make a new cinematic language, a new TV language, you know, um, in order to do that, there's all kinds of work and relationships that you have to have, I have to have, that are in kind of a, a constant state of like being stretched. You know what I mean? Like, because, you know, there's a, my experience, at least on this season, was just like how the nature of, COVID, the nature of what was going on with the merger at HBO, of course, the nature of what was going on with like, um, you know, I guess the explicit um, shaky ground that sort of TV production has been on and film production has been on, um, was that like, there was even more scrutinization, you know what I mean, of like what we were doing creatively, we were doing from a producing perspective, just process wise. And that ultimately there was no easing of that tension. You know what I mean? It was more, you know, an experience of like understanding the circumstances that were creating that tension and trying to make the best decisions so that nothing broke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that ultimately like it didn't all fall apart. Um, and, you know, I'm still like contending with just what it has felt like to be at that level of tension for that amount of time, you know what I mean? To, to complete the show, obviously. But I'm also like, just in a, you know, kind of looking at the show itself and really proud of and startled by how um, the product itself, like the thing itself, you know, achieves what we set out to do you know what i mean in terms of making making a new language so yeah. one of the, th think about one of the things i i hearing you say that right i think one of the things the show benefited from was just that inherent sort of rhythm you have with some of the writers and directors that reach beyond just the room and on the set you know you know we've been also fortunate to have you know a lot of the eps you know, Kelly Kishori, Jamin return, you know, to sort of come in. But we also had, you know, the support in addition to anonymous content this year, you know, sort of supporting it. And I think at the end of the day, you know, even with all of that consistency and newness, we we're all sort of faced with the changing of the industry in a way, you know, mm -hmm. right in the middle of us trying to make, you know, the show have that level of consistency that we did years ago.
But I think what I want to rest on a little bit, which I thought was so interesting, is this year's theme of pirate and king. You know, you like to task me as being a, a king and you a pirate. Yeah, I didn't task you. That was you. You said you that. Know, just... You and I go back and forth. <laughs> I think there's a spectrum, you know. Uh, but if, you, if you're going to call me a king, I, I'm a proud king knowing that, you know, you are a biased pirate. <laughs> so... Um, I think that dynamic of the pirate and the king can answer a lot of what people might have the question of how is it possible to still create such a show mm-hmm. so many, you know, years removed and still get that sort of result of the type of show that we have. And so I'm curious a lot because I kind of know where the catalyst of the idea of pirate and king, mm-hmm. but I'm just curious now that you're removed from it and you've able to see the show out there and getting even some feedback from people, what, what have been people responses to the sort of theme of how Pirate and King also works in, in their respective lives? You know, it's interesting. I mean, one thing that um, I'm still, I feel like we still need to figure out is facilitating that conversation for our audience. You know, we, we did not um, create a space for that to happen. Um, and, we need to, and the um, so I, yeah, I haven't heard too too much. I do feel like there's there's definitely, and I think the success of the essay in that in that kind of a thread that spine of the story is that there feels like a lot of equality between the amount of people who are like I'm a king, I'm a pirate, you know. This feels like it's not like. I haven't noticed a trend like more people are identifying as one or the other, you know, which I think, yeah, it speaks to just how even handed, even though I, like you said, it's biased, like I wrote it, I'm a fire, <laughs> you know, but I feel like ultimately the show, you know, gives a lot of, gives space for both, you know, in their full expressions of both, both <coughs> and their kind of healed states. Um, and I think, you know, like as I reflect on it, you know, ultimately the the thing that maybe is easy to lose because the analysis itself is so, and even the example is like, you know, Prince is a pirate, Michael Jackson is a king, you know, that that ended in death, you know what I mean? Um, in, in how it's told in the story, it's cautionary, you know? Um, and so it's easy to lose at the point of the, the essay and then the story that kind of fills it out or flushes it out of Naja and Terrence is that there's an infinite creative opportunity for Pirates and Kings to be together and make great things. And I think, you know, Random Acts benefits greatly from our collaboration as a Pirate and the King, you know? <laughs> and, you know, it benefits greatly from my self-awareness that I'm a pirate, your self-awareness that you're a king, and that we need each other. I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. You know what I mean? Like, and specifically our skill sets are our own skill sets. You know what I mean? And um, the thing that can be achieved is like something like this, you know, something like the show that is like explicitly unprecedented, explicitly could, cannot be achieved, you know, with, without, um, both, you know, um, without that level of balance, you know, on on this sort of binary, which is, you know, not a spectrum for clear reasons. <laughs> but I think just what I do here, you know, there was a few people who try to like come with the like, I'm a I'm a pirate when I need to be in the king, you know, like little spectrum kind of like statements. And I I contend, you know, like it says in the show and on Instagram that like, ultimately there's there's all kinds of really good reasons why, you know, it feels very emotionally charged to identify with one or the other, you know, um, in any given moment. And why it also feels emotionally charged to feel boxed into one of them. You know what I mean? Like as a pirate, a person, you know, that I know that that's what's most natural in me, you know, it could feel frustrating that, some of the, the skills of a king 
which could be very helpful to me in certain moments, are not natural to me, or not available to me, or I would not do them as well as a king would do them. You know what I mean? I think that's just a really charged energy, especially for Black people when we're in a moment, in all moments, trying to survive and make the most out of what we have, which is usually in certain situations limited. And I feel like that feeling of being boxed in and needing another person is so uncomfortable that it pushes you and people towards wanting there to be a spectrum because a spectrum means you don't need nobody else. You can also, you can survive in any situation without anybody else, you know? And I think that that's unfortunately not true. You know, like you need that, we need each other to, to thrive, you know, kind of what it says, you know? So that's my last pitch on why there's no spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that you need to not be boxed in and that charged energy. I mean, a lot of it, as you know, if not careful, it can mean the wrong thing. You know, I think if you are being called a pirate, one can, again, when I talked about the need to hit marks, one could look at it as someone not incapable of hitting marks and playing within the system. And you know, that's oftentimes how people choose whether someone gets the job or not, right? Is this sort of false sense narrative that because you are, you know, um, you're about the process and the journey that you're incapable of understanding professionally what the task is. And you have the sense of maybe going rogue, not you as a Terrence, but I'm saying pirates, right? Whereas in the idea of the king, you know, if not careful, it could suggest someone not to be trusted. You know, someone who is only going to protect the power and not the artist, you know, and really sort of be worried more about the power than it is about the integrity. And I think whether or not it's intended to do that, I think in our industry, you know, the industry is designed to weed out people, you know, it, it, it's unfair. And that's not something that I think should be celebrated, but it just is what it is. And I think until enough change happens that allow room for people to respect the, the power that comes with the position we're in and then the freedom to be artistic, you're always going to get people wary about any label that suggests an inability to deliver and an overcompensation of abuse of power. Um, but yeah, that's, I think maybe, maybe I'm also pessimistic about, well, actually I should say it this way. The two things, the two uh, examples you gave are toxic examples of a pirate and a king. Yeah, right? and I was gonna go there for a second because <laughs> I also know that the other part of yours is about a toxic and healed king. Exactly. And pirate. So you you beat me you beat me to my second point. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I essentially, yeah, I think that one one can the overemphasis on the toxic expression of any archetype is ultimately something mostly black people and women have to deal with. You know what I mean? Black women mostly, you know. So it's like that's just a, a reality that like everybody's human, so they're gonna in some moments have a toxic expression of their cells and have sometimes to heal. The hope, the hope is you can be healed. You can you can win more than you lose. You know what I mean? You want, you want a winning record in that way. But but I think essentially like just what you said about the industry and how it weeds people out is designed to do that. You know what I mean? It, you, you know, a, a very seasoned line producer who made all kinds of huge like movies once told me, you know, you want to be repeat business, Terrence. You know, you said a version of that to me too. Like, you know, this these studios, they like somebody they can come to and then come back to and come back to and come back to because they make them the money. You know what I mean? And um, you know, it's kind of a normal that it's not like a revolutionarily astute observation. But the extent to which it, which is true in terms of industrialization is always like, you know, um sort of been boldly shown to me in different dy dynamics because of how even as a fact, it's, it's super antithetical to my own vision of my practice, which is to literally 
um, break precedents I even set in the last thing I did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be repeated. I don't want to repeat myself. You know what I mean? And I think that so much of the um, concept of the industry is built on that. Like, you want people to operate the assembly line very well, you know, so that all these people can keep their jobs and go well in that way. And so I'm, I'm deeply, like, ambivalent, but mostly pessimistic about the capacity of the industry to accommodate like what you said, some sort of honoring or possibility of honoring the, the necessity of healed, you know, in this case, Pirate and Kings working together to, to make something um, original, different for the heart. And more what I'm kind of observing, and I think our experience on season two, you tell me if you think that this is true, but our, our, our experience evidences this, which is that you end up just eking by, you know what I mean? You just end up just winning in the fourth quarter on that last drive because of the most healed expressions coming together and committing to it in a way that like is inherently like extremely high stakes, extremely difficult, extremely difficult to repeat, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and that there's a, there's a certain harrowing, totally unsustainable, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like energy to that. Um, and, and obviously the, the assumption of the, in, the industry is to replicate it. And, you know, we're left like, no, we should do it very differently. <laughs> it should not be done that well, way. I, I want to take a beat. I want to take a beat to acknowledge the people who might be listening to this for a second, because you know, Aaron, I just have to thank you once again for having platforms like this to allow, you know, conversations like this to happen. What many people may or may not know is that the way Terrence and I are talking right now is literally how sometimes we would talk at midnight the day before a shoot or the day before a deadline for an edit. I mean, it's literally, you know, I'll, he and I will be riffing and talking this way. And sometimes it's also therapeutic for us to go through the process, but it's also challenging each other, you know, to stay sort of the course of what we know we're setting out to do. And we'll look up sometime, be two hours in, <laughs> and then be like, oh, yeah, we got to the phone. We got to finish that thing, you know. Um, but I say this to acknowledge because, you know, Terrence, I had to learn over the years, you know, you have a shorthand on how you speak, right? And it's also very similar to the show. Right. It's it's a shorthand that I think people who are entrenched in sort of your work and understanding, they 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 follow it. And then others, they might have to go back and listen to sort of get the sep the second sort of uh taking of it. But I think just for the the source of this uh the, the I mean the, the sake of this conversation, I think it might be helpful to sort of explain what you mean by a healed you know, archetype, like a pirate and king? Like, what do you mean by something being healed? Yeah, so, uh, you know, going back to your example of a toxic king, somebody who's obsessed with power and in a movie context, prioritizes power over original creative expression, you know, um, that'd be a toxic expression of the king. You know, we all know kings like that, you know, there's lots of TV shows about them, but, um, you know, maybe what you see less of is a healed expression of a king, for instance, using their power and access to bring two sides together, two other powerful sides together to reconcile or heal a, um, a conflict in a way that only they could do. You know what I mean? Um, making a difficult decision is gonna benefit most, most of the people, you know, but that's based on infrastructure, that's boring, that's not, you know, like exciting or sexy, but it's like the road gotta get built. We gotta build the road from here to here so that the grain can get here to here, you know what I mean? Like, um, you know, and I think that there's a lot of um, sort of concepts of, of power that are about um, considering all factors, being able to hold, you know, and it's something you do really well. Um, 
a lot of complex factors that are about human relationships, about material conditions of production, about how much money this person got, about what just happened in this person's personal life, this big bring to the table, you know, where we're at in the industry, what the economy is doing, like four billion factors, consider them all, consult with the right people, come to a decision that you can explain, knowing that it's going to hurt this person this way, but that's going to have to ride because it's going to benefit these 10 people and then that person's going to be able to, you know, like that level of um, decision making that can kind of only come from having a certain capacity energetically, emotionally, and materially. It comes from a level of, of power. That's a, you know, a healed expression of a king. You know what I mean? Um, someone with a pirate, you know, toxic pirate, always talking about the treasure, but where the treasure at? You know, you just, at this point, we starve and you're looking for food. <laughs> like, you just, oh, you're having fun with the wind. You know what I mean? Toxic, whatever, you know, or running up on people and then taking their shit. You know what I mean? Like, whatever it is without asking, you know, toxic pirate stuff. There's a lot you can think of. Not delivering you know, um, to, to your point. But there's all kinds of like um, fresh new ideas that come out of open-ended exploration, you know, not over essentializing the desperation, focusing on the process more than the destination. You know what I mean? Um, what it means to be in service to the, the elements, to the ocean and the, and the wind and be able to listen to um, things that wouldn't make sense to a king. Like all those factors, we're I mean, not listening to all those factors. I'm listening to a different energy, a different power, you know, because what can come through that is specific to that space, you know what I mean? So those are more healed expressions of, of a pirate. And I think that, um, you know, ultimately, you know, it's yin and yang, basic laws of the universe, you know what I mean? Like any element, any entity, um, you know, is gonna have both you know, and, and, you know, you seek balance, like this one of the lines in the show, you know, we seek balance, you know, and not necessarily balance, like 50% toxic, 50% healed, but, you know, just knowing that the general law of the universe is that you're going to have to move through both, you know what I mean? Whether you're, as a, you're my, for myself as a pirate, experiencing those two things in myself and having to like, you know, notice when it's toxic and try and turn, turn it towards healed and, you know, notice when it's healed and try and do more of that, whether it's that or being in a relationship with the king and knowing like, all right, you considering too many things in this decision, you need to really listen to me because I have a feeling and you need to trust the feeling. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> being in that dynamic or being like, actually all those factors you just said, that sound like, <laughs> that sound great. We should go, you know, like, you know, it's a it's a it's a dance you know there's no guidebook on it but you know having to be in awareness that there's there's both healed and toxic creative and destructive of, of anything and, and and to be able to navigate that is 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 the goal you know and i think that's why you and i can sit here and i can say i'm, I'm a king and you can say you're a pirate and you know, because I, again, full circle, I know about the idea of a healed king and a healed pirate, you know, and I went back, if you go back and you see, I started out by saying it was about my relationships, right? And I think, as you know, you know, a big factor into being able to navigate all of this was being able to go between you, HBO, and even Anonymous um, on those relationships and sort of negotiate what was needed to be able to to deliver this season, um, as well as all the sort of talent in in in, in, the, in the crew and the team, um, but I think what I want to do is is also just tee up something else that we're talking about because underlining and all of that too. Again, like I said, the reason why people don't want to think about it as a pirate or a king because there's this uncertainty right now in the industry that if not careful, you could be labeled as the toxic version, right? But I think underneath all of that, what it really comes down to is resources. You know, I think there is a the most version. king statement of all time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but it but I'm embracing it. There is right. the, it comes down to resources, you know, the ability to execute what you're trying to do. Because there are a lot of people in this industry right now that are experiencing a lack of resources a lack of the ability to be able to do. And we've seen waves and different versions of who gets to be behind the camera, in front of the camera, in the room. But I think we all know, whether we, we are 
prepared for it, that we're going through a very different turbulence right now in this industry in terms of what it's morphing into and what shows get aired, what shows are being greenlit, you know, who are the people being able to, what is the compensation? You know, there's a larger conversation around that being had. And I'm curious to both of you, it's less about trying to make any grandiose predictions about what we think the industry is. It's more, how does an artist like you, Terrence, who, like you said, that's such a keen thing to think, right? So how does an artist such as you, or even Aaron, I know you work with a lot of different people. What do you think is the best preparation for someone like yourself as we are experiencing these, these next sort of iterations of the industry? I mean, I'm going to say from my experience <laughs> as an almost 52-year-old woman um, and all of the work I've done in my life and how I've given up pretty much everything in my life to be where I am right now, it's about following your truth. And I think that, um, you know, there's like a Buddhist model, which is um, uh, a break build and be, and it's, um, the break is, uh, being inside the system and, you know, disrupting or, or trying to break it and create something new within. And then, uh, the, the build is doing something outside the system and creating something brand new. And the B is like your own spiritual practice within. And I think, in this day and age, you kind of have to be in all three of those spaces. And I think that people just have to, like in the film business, especially, I, I mean, I think it's all about building something new because the way it's going down now is just not, and I, I'm not even in the film business anymore. Like I'm, I'm done, like I'm getting this union going and then I have no idea what I'm doing next. But like, I just think that um, we just have to do things differently than because it's not working the way it's working right now. So I think that the way that I, and I believe that I, I've, I'm able to do this now because I do have a lot of trust in myself and I have nothing to lose anymore, <laughs> basically. Um, that uh, you just have to follow your truth. You know, you have to follow and it's discovering what that truth is, which I'm sure lots of people don't even know what their truth is, right? Because they're just trying to, to make it in the world. But I think like, and I'm not sure you can talk about it on this, this call, but I, I'm so interested to hear if making this show, was it, was it a healing process? Or did it cause a lot of angst and anxiety instead of instead of like a freedom, I guess, even though the show feels very much like it was it was freeing. Um, I'm just wondering, like I can't, I'm just curious how you guys balanced that. And and to me, it must have been a lot. Yeah, yeah. I'll leave a lot of that question to Terrence because I'm also curious about even Terrence on a back to also what I was asking, just curious how you're preparing, you know, artistically for, you know, the industry. Do you stay the same and it's status quo? I mean, the same as your process has been or do you adapt? You know, like, how are you preparing? Uh. You know, I disagree with you. Okay, I don't disagree with you. I love so, it. I love it. Let's go. <laughs> I, don't, I don't disagree with you. Like that. Yeah. Like you know, if you read the trades, you know, this network's content budget might go from a billion dollars to seven hundred fifty million or something like that. Right? There's there's probably literally less money being spent than last year, the year before. Um. So let's say, you know, that's a fact of resources. I disagree that which the statement you led with, with it, that it's at the end of the day all about that or that that's the foundational reality that dictates decision-making by those people. And I think that, you know, if a development executive had a billion dollars to make a billion dollars worth of cool stuff, um, one year and then the next year, let's say they just have half of that. Um, they're not gonna 
not to pick on this person, but they're not going to not make all the law and orders. They're going to just keep making the law and orders. You know what I mean? They're going to still like all eight of those law and orders. You know what I mean? Um, you know, they're going to cut the strange black stuff. They're going to cut the strange, you know, Spanish speaking, Spanish language stuff. They're going to cut the strange queer stuff. You know what I mean? And inherent to your sort of analysis, and I think to most people's analysis of the industry is that they're cutting that stuff because of a concept of it and a, a, and a cultural read of it that it is quote unquote risky financially, that it is a smaller audience. It's, you know, these assumptions about what, they, what, what uh, those stories, or what our stories are ultimately, the three of us on this call. And um, that assumption, you know, one assumes that those people making those decisions are what I call Vulcans. Like there's this assumption that in Western society generally, there's unbiased people who make very clear financial or legal decisions outside of their own cultural framework or their own um, biases. You know, like a judge is kind of like this idea that there's, that person exists, a Vulcan or a journalist, like that they can be unbiased. You know, there's just a, it's, it's a sort of probably rooted in some sort of platonic kind of philosophy but that that personality exists. But that doesn't exist. Humans are humans, they're not Vulcans. We are not Vulcans. And we're not making that, that development executive is sure ain't no damn Vulcan. They're a person with kids in private school, you know what I mean? And they went to Exeter, you know what I mean? And they're making decisions about Dick Wolf, not because of that one billion went to 500 million, it's because of what they learned at Exeter. You know what I mean? And we constantly re live in a reality where we want to believe that there is a brass tax set of facts that dictate sound financial decisions by that person at any given company. But one of the only truths of capitalism that is probably unpopular is that corporations are people. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're people with biases and cultural frameworks. It's like AIs are written by people with biases and cultural frameworks that they're bringing to that process. So the output you get. Um, is not about any kind of or any concept of a reliable judgment that they're making to so that the people in their department keep their jobs. Because if that was true, people in departments would keep their jobs, but they don't seem to. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of cycles of boom and bust of people getting fired. So clearly that's not what's happening. Instead, what happens is people put forth what they mama or their daddy said was safe and what made them feel good when they were a kid what makes them feel comfortable. And what makes them feel comfortable is what resembles their uncle or their aunt or their kid or what they think their kid laughed at, you know what I mean? And ultimately, the way I navigate it is I, I live in the truth of that. That when I'm talking to somebody, I'm talking to their culture. And if I'm talking to a white person in the industry that's power, I'm understanding that they're coming from you know, white American culture in, a certain, in, in that situation. I'm talking to a black person, black American culture, or, you know, if I'm talking to an immigrant from a different part of the world, I'm, I'm talking to the, their culture. But, and that's complicated because, you know, people lean towards one thing or the other sometimes. They, they don't want to be who they are or they want to be too much of who they, you know, like there's all kinds of dynamics there. But I think that the way I operate is within that truth so that a truthful conversation can be had about what, we should make together if we're gonna make anything together, as opposed to a lie about what should or shouldn't get made based on, based on their budget. All of Terrence, that's such a pirate answer. <laughs> 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 and, and I love you for it. You'll actually find that what I said is actually not that much different for me, which is why I always argue with you that there's a spectrum. But I think there's a slight difference that I want you to 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 know and I think anyone listening to this you know when I was speaking about the idea of resources when it's down to it it was never about like why people make the decision based on how many much resources they have because at the end of the day I think the mistake any producer or creator can make is that they can actually get into the culture and the mind of the business decisions of the executive they're pitching to there's so many factors that go into it, depending on who you're pitching to and where they're at. And it's forever changing. So even when you get those little lists that people put out and say, this is what 
the networks are looking for the whatever it changes literally the week after it gets sent out you know um there's no one size fit all so it's everything is about relying on your 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 experience your your truth and and the same token your relationships to figure out what is the best pathway to get the thing you're trying to make I think when I was talking about research, this is more about around the idea of going back to what I was talking about is a fear, a fear of why people even don't want to be labeled anything that makes it toxic or whatever, or give the wrong impression. Because when there is a lack of resources, it doesn't allow for everyone to feel like they can make safe decisions or be able to make the things they want to make. And that fear is not just limited to just those two reactions. But the fear allows for sometimes an overreaction in the industry um, or, or, or in some way don't allow for the artistic process that I know you, for example, cherish, which is somebody seeing the vision for what it is, supporting it for how it needs to be supported and sort of allowing you the space to be an artist. And when you have a culture of fear, it doesn't allow room for that to grow. And I think what we've benefited from is that HBO as a platform has always been a place that's artist friendly. And yes, they have their limitations, don't get me wrong. It's not like they're just an abundance of resources, but the culture makes up for the limitations that sometimes the resources doesn't allow. You know, you go there and you're able to be able to be heard as an artist. And there's other places, not to say that there isn't any other place that, that doesn't do that, but I think, again, the lack of resources across the industry, in my opinion, is to create in a level of heightened fear of people sort of not sort of meet an artist where they need to be met in order to support their process to be able to get at the core of what they're trying to do. And that's that heart that I'm talking about again. So I think what I was trying to not only sort of to paint, but lead to again, how then does an artist like you that needs that level of support, that needs that, that, that sort of, um, you know, uh, larger sort of support, how do you prepare when there's this, you know, maybe you don't agree, but there feels to me like there is a sense of fear in the industry right now because there's a lack of resources sometime across the board for people to do what they safely feel like they can do. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that that fear, maybe because I've always encountered many versions of that fear, I, I've never felt like that wasn't there, maybe. It's also something I'm like in awareness of, um, you know, and, and how that fear is, I guess what I'm saying is like inherently illogical. It is not actually linked to a legit moment they have, you know what I mean? Um, you know, this whole thing is always in a boom and bust cycle you know, just laws of society, of energy, of capitalism, but just like, it's always gonna inflate and shrink and inflate and shrink. And I think that um, whether or not somebody is afraid in a certain moment, you know, just has to be essentially um, transmuted, you know what I mean? Uh, which sometimes is slow work, sometimes it's fast, you know what I mean? You have to invite people into my own relative fearlessness in certain ways, but then, you know, my own relative vulnerability. And, you know, the fears I have are not um, by their nature creative, you know? Um, and I think that ultimately, like, if there is some way for me to relate to somebody who feels like they're in a state of like, if I don't, you know, deliver something that is a hit or close to a hit, I might lose my job or, or even just maybe more kind of like in a linear way, you know, really want something to work and knows that the, the nature of the system of the industry, especially if there's a lot of kind of cooks in the kitchen on all sides, this makes it really difficult for something that's sort of honed into one thing, difficult to get through, you know, like, afraid that it'll fall apart. There's all kinds of things that can happen to a project that, that makes the product not what people want it to be. You know what I mean? Well, I think, well then take it. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just, I think that the, um, 
fi finding a way to relate to that as like and just a just an energetic positionality you know what i mean like we all would is know what it's like to fear the unknown i know what it's like you know and, and try and like move through that together as opposed to in opposition you know it's the thing that i have not been able to do but i would hope to you know what i mean like i haven't been able to necessarily feel like next to somebody in a position of power and say like i know you're afraid of these things I might be too in certain ways. I understand how you feel. Let's move through that without thinking it's each other. It's, you know, like we're on the same side of the fear because it's a general energetic. But I think that that's probably the way through it. If there's like a way in the future, it's like standing next to each other and, and challenging fears and energy, picking it apart um, as opposed to taking it, taking it as an invitation to have an opposition point of view. That's why, look, this is why you and I work so well together, because as I always tell you, I learned in my experience that people either operate from two positions, fear or strength. And, you know, I've always operated on a level of strength. And so to you, like to you, to, like you, the idea of fear is foreign to me. I understand it in the sense that that's sometimes, unfortunately, the person across the desk that you are sort of trying to negotiate things with. But I think, again, you know, I commend you because I understand what it took this season for you to, you know, sacrifice a level of not only your, your physical self, but your, your, your mental and emotional. Um, you know, this is a season that's very personal to you. Um, the amount of hours and, and personal resources you even put into this, you know, again, people don't know the full extent the way that I do, but if I haven't ever publicly said it to you, you know, I just admire you. And it's a big reason why I fight so hard to sort of make sure what I know you're setting out do get ex get sort of executed. Um, but I wanna just also just go back to something Aaron touched upon because I think this season is so personal. Um, I'm just curious if you want to or in a space to share just like, what was that like? Like why did it rest so much on the personal and what was, since fear wasn't one of them, like what was some of the things you were sort of tapping into and, and why were that necessary to sort of bring out in the show creatively? Yeah, I mean, so many reasons, you know, I think maybe personal, you know, what this, if you look at anything I've made, this is just what it is, you know, what I mean? like it's just how I operate in the sense of like, you know, I'm processing my experiences, you know, directly and then performing as a character named Terrence often, you know, in, in a lot of my work, you know. Um, and I think the things I have made that, you know, are numerous without me performing a character named Terrence are just unknown to people. I don't think people even know those things exist really, you know what I mean? Like all the other films and made stuff. Because it just doesn't, you know, I'm not in it, you know, I'm not the face of it may feel differently. But for this kind of, you know, part of my practice, I think there is also some level of, a big level of channeling everybody else's experiences through me and my body. Um, and it's part of the challenge of that is making other people's experiences feel personal or feel like they could be lived through this character that happens to be their Terrence. And so I think, it, you know, it's another one of those both ends, like, it's seeming as personal as it is, is a, is a part of just a certain level of rigor of incorporating other people's experiences into my body. Um, it, it, it's half that, it, it is half like me processing my own experiences, you know? Um, but it's sort of necessary that it all feels like my experience, you know what I mean? So that, you know, it, it hits, it sells, you know? Um, and it's contained. In, in a focused way in uh, my performance. And, you know, there's that. There's also this, uh, the reality that the pandemic, you know, really, if it wasn't already high stakes, what we all as artists, myself as an artist choose to spend my energy on, 
it became even more, you know, important to practice a high level of discernment around why I even decide to put the energy into your point, all these resources into making a TV show. You know what I mean? What is what is the use became a very important question. You know what I mean? Like, how is this useful to me, my family, my spirit, you know, my body to other people, you know? And it became clear that if it was to be useful in a moment where because of the nature of human survival, anything we were doing needs to be useful. If this was gonna be useful, um, it had to be a story that focused on processing through wounding, you know, and wounding this mine and also my families or my communities or this the, the earth, you know, um, because we were as a society and I was as a person and we all are in different moments um, moving through different points on a continuum of healing or, you know, recuperating a wound. So I think that that discernment and that clarity came from just the level of intensity of, of how, you know, painful and disconnected in a way. The, you know, pandemic made us all feel, made me feel, made the writers feel. And so we were just talking about real shit, you know what I mean? Like in a way that we were always talking about, of course, because we're close and we're friends and, and we did the first season. There was this, there were stakes in that same way, but they were driven by a different thing. They were driven by, you know, that was the, the Freddie Gray moment. It, it was also the, the, this sort of feeling like black radical thought experience aesthetics would never be platformed and shared on a channel with this much visibility again. <laughs> you know, it was like the sense of, that was the stakes for me and I feel like for a lot of us. And because that happened, then the stakes became something else. You know what I mean? Um, and, you know, ultimately the, the creative possibility of growing as a, as a practitioner of the form of cinema, the way I do it, you know, requires that I, as somebody who does a lot of things technically, you know, edits, dances, sings, you know, acts, writes, directs, you know, does the score. Given that I'm doing all those things, um, is important and is, is sort of something I do semi-consciously is create a container for myself to put myself at the edge of my capacity in those disciplines so that I can get better at them, you know? And season one brought me to a certain level, for instance, as an actor, but it wasn't, you know, a stretch. But as an editor, it really stretched me, you know? And so for season two, you know, I really want to stretch as a dancer. I really want to stretch as a singer. I want to stretch as a actor. But I didn't really need to stretch that much as an editor because I don't really, you know what I mean? I, I wanted to stretch less, but so season two, it still stressed me a little bit as an editor, but I, I was trying to make sure that as a creative experience, and, and I think this translates to how quote unquote personal it feels, some of those different disciplines that I, I use to make the show, you know, really, um, were of use to me as, a, as an artist in a, in a process of, of refining my, my crafts, you know, and my, my, my um, modes of expressing my skills, you know. Um, and I think that because that craft iterates in so many different pieces of the show, you end up with like a lot of, you know, courses of the meal that have my hot sauce on it, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it like, it probably feels more quote unquote personal than it is from an information perspective because of that process, you know what I mean? The dancing, I was like noticing, I was like, damn, Terrence is a good dancer. 
<laughs> Shout out to Damani Pompey, our choreographer, who's, who's the director. He worked with me for, for a while, you know, like for, for months, you know, trying to get to that level. So Yeah, it was good. Yeah, I really felt like you pushed the envelope. The music too was really, really strong on all the different aspects of it and the writing just the the writing on the on the screen you know the different kind of poetry that was in there or i thought that was also really beautiful mm-hmm. and it, it did seem like it was uh you know from working with you on as told to god thyself and 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 seeing the you know some of the first season like just seeing that that pushing you know the ceiling it was really mm-hmm. it was really nice to witness and uh, and then I just love, you know, that was kind of one of the reasons we started Film Roundtable, right? Because we started it right in J- June of 2020. And, you know, it was like really having that strong feeling that we're all so isolated right now. And everyone was going through their different experience during this process and during the pandemic. And everyone in the world at this stage, even in some of the most underserved communities have people have smartphones, you know, and and they have video on their smartphone. And it's like anyone could film themselves and their experience and, you know, have a brother or sister or neighbor shoot, you know, shoot them on their phone and they could tell their story and therein lies the medicine right there, you know? And if they post it on YouTube and one person sees it or they show it to the people in their community, I mean, that's medicine for them to be able to express themselves and be seen and be heard and to tell what they're going through. And so I, you know, it really resonates with me that, you know, your process during the pandemic and thinking about um, doing season two and, and what that means for you, um, you know, of all the healing that needs to happen, you know, within ourselves, within our, our lineages, within our community, within the collective, within the earth, you know, and all these different levels. And, um, and, and that's where I think what you did is like, it is building something new outside of, of the barriers that we live in, you know, you're kind of, you're doing something really different. Like I worked on the Chappelle show, which you know, is obviously very different from your show, but in the same way, he, he was also breaking, you know, boundaries back then was something that was never done, you know, before in those, and talk, I mean, we, I think that they gave our scripts to PAs in the law department or just interns, because I didn't think they thought the show was going to become anything. So we never, nothing ever came back to back is that we couldn't make it. Like, I can't even believe what they allowed us to make in that first season. Cause no one, I don't think anybody read the scripts. They were just like, okay, yeah, go ahead and make this. And, um, and, and I think it's beautiful to see like another generation of that happening right now with, with what you're doing, you know, which is, it's taking it to a whole next level, you know, mm-hmm. Which is really. Uh, which is I will really- say, HBO's legal department is definitely reading the scripts. Also, <laughs> 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 in like 2002, I think. Yeah, it was a little different then. You know, in 2002, I don't even know if Comedy Central was owned by by then. I can't remember if they were or not. But I, I just don't think you know. Uh, Neil and and Dave wanted that show to be on HBO, and HBO said no. So Comedy Central became like, you know, the 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 the, the catch all, and um, and I just I read don't... somewhere that they were like, oh, we already have Chris Rock. Or something. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I really don't think the shotgun they, to the head. <laughs> they weren't paying much attention, you know, <laughs> until uh, until it started, you know, made all that money on um, on DVDs, and they were like, oh my god, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I think congratulations. Like it's amazing that you guys you guys made that and that's out there in the universe. And um is there like a is I mean, are you it is did it is it doing well? Is HBO happy? Could you make something else with them next? Like I'm sure it takes some time to re um energize after doing something like that. I can only imagine. But what are you guys up to next together? Um, I think they're happy creatively, you know, um, our department, um, shout out to Aaron Sapina who really fought hard for the show in late night. Um, 
you know, was just a real big advocate of, of, of the show in season two, just having a level of um, protection at the network, you know, like trust, trusting what we were doing, given that it always, it has to be unprecedented, you know, it can't be like, what, it can't be even what last season was, you know, uh, the first season. So, you know, he, he's really happy with it. Nina Rosenstein also um, advocate of the show, you know, initially greenlit it and, um, you know, is feeling it creatively. You know, I think that, you know, God willing will make, will make more things for sure. Um, and, you know, we haven't really talked about anything further, but, you know, I'm definitely in recovery mode, but also think about, you know, what to do next, working on some music and, um, you know, just uh, also working on creating a TV network. <laughs> so that's, that's very important, you know. And, you know, as far as, I, you know, as I was saying, I mean, Terrence, for example, shot it out, um, Nina and, and Aaron, and, you know, this show would not have gotten made without them, you know, seeing it for what it was and, and allowing us to, to be a partner with them um, and sort of figuring out the best way to sort of bring this to, to the network. I mean, this show could have easily got, uh, been one of those shows that the, the, the network and the execs got in the way. Um, not really sort of trusting or understanding the vision, but if anything, you know, again, that true partnership was what really brought it through. And I benefit greatly that, you know, I have also a first look deal through my company at HBO. So there's uh, lots of conversations around different projects that we are uh, looking at and developing and will continue to do so. Um, but, you know, in terms of even, you know, Terrence and I, I mean, for life, <laughs> you know, so, you know, he's in recovery mode right now. I'm always on the ready. So it's just a matter of time for he and I go back in the booth and figure out, you know, what is the next sort of creative thing we gonna mesh on, um, so. Can, do you want to, can you talk Terrence about the network that you're trying to um, create? Or is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we already, we already started a bit, <laughs> um, you know, myself and, um, our partners at Omicron Creative Partners, Nanette, Mishka, myself, Brad, and Jen. We're doing. My daughter's babysitting Mishka's kids now. <laughs> Every Tuesday and Thursday, she picks them up at school. <laughs> Amazing. I know those guys really well. <laughs> um, and you know, we a few years back started a collaboration uh, with Telfar. Of our TV, which is downloadable on your Roku or Fire Stick at present. And there's nothing on it at present, um, but we're working to, to figure out the practice um, of TV, of the flow of TV, the energy there, and to, to make it ours, make it how we make it, you know, in our language. Um, and, you know, we've been building, building on that for, for a while. Um, and yeah, more to come for sure as we, as we figure that out. Nice. That's exciting. Hmm. Is there any other thing you want us to cover? <laughs> Me? <laughs> or that Terrence wants to come. Oh, yeah. What, I, what I'm know. also happy about what, what Film Roundtable does is allow room for conversation. As I told you up top, Aaron, you know, I don't prepare for these type of things because this always has to come from, again, the heart, be organic. And, you know, you and everyone was able to, um, you know, get a splice of just the conversations Terrence and I have. I'm, I'm, thankful that this one is recorded so I can go back and say, hi, see, Terrence, I told you, I said this and that, you know, I could play. <laughs> <That's terrible. laughs> and and you will do that. Just yes. so yeah. I'm, I'm going to go back and replay this like it's an episode of Random Acts of Flyness. And you'll see all the hidden gems of things I was saying to you, uh, Terrence. Um, but, you know, again, these conversations are also needed, not just for us, but I think 
for the larger community, which we're trying to support. You know, I am a producer just yeah. as much as I'm a uh, creative myself, right? So I always look for trying to meet artists where they're at. And, you know, again, I don't always pretend that I have all the answers. And a lot of times, even in this, I might say something, go back and go up, you know, and be informed by it. But I just get excited about being able to sit down with, you know, people like Terrence and continue the dialogue and the process. This, this will lead to when we finally get back into the booth, some other sort of concept, germ of an idea, some IP, some something, you know? So yeah. the, the writer's room is already happening um, as you see it in, in full fledged. Yeah, and it's, it's really good for people to just see how different collaborations work and different directors, different producers, different, you know, other above the line creatives um because everybody has a different process you know and 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 that's the important thing is people have to find what works for them and how to how to make those connections and find partners um and you know on that i would just like love to maybe uplift sean peters because i know he did the first season with you and did the second season and he's shot all of your work i think right all of your projects that you've done yeah like 90, 90, yeah five for sure shout yeah. out to sean he's amazing on he's so talented and um and i think i even read in the new yorker article about the show i think they uplifted him on that too just you know his visual language between the two seasons um and that was just really uh -huh. nice to hear him being acknowledged um because that doesn't always happen especially in tv shows for cinematographers um Mm -hmm. And did you work with, I know Akeen wasn't available, obviously, for the second season, but um, who's your production designer lots of, lots of times, um, but did you work, who, was, who did your costumes on, on this season? Charlize Antoinette, amazing costume designer. Yeah, you're really beautiful. Uh, really amazing. And shout out also to Sarah Williams from the first season. Uh, who also helped out a bit on the second season. She actually ended up having a child right as we started to shoot. So it was like, we couldn't work together. But, you know, Charlize really, um, we, had, we had worked together before. It, it kind of came up together, honestly, you know, just um, in New York um, as friends. And just what she brought to the show, you know, was she was channeling through what her ancestors intended, you know, for for us to photograph, um, you know, people in a real specific expression of their bodies, um, you know, in, in connection to these spiritual entities and emotions, which was, um, it's always fun to make that concrete, you know, when you see someone on a page like that. And Nora Mendez, um, she's an amazing production designer. Um, you know, this was my, not technically my first time working with her, but on a film, <laughs> my first time, because we were working on our exhibition, which uh, I'm doing my first um, solo show at ICA in Philadelphia. It opens on March 10th and it's called Swarm. Um, and it'll be up until, I believe, July. Uh, but hopefully, put that in the description. <laughs> That's actually what's next. Yeah, say, uh, you can you repeat it again? Because on my end, right when you said the name of the gallery, it froze and maybe it didn't in the recording, but I just want to make sure that, can you just repeat your about your solo show again? Yeah. On March 9th at ICA Philadelphia, um, Contemporary Art Museum in Philadelphia, um, I'm having my first solo show. Uh, it's called Swarm. It opens on March 10th, Friday, mm -hmm. come to the opening. You know, nice. for that. And uh, it'll be up until the summer, uh, I believe in June, June or July. But yeah, come check it out. Is it a collaboration or is it um, a combination? Is it is it multimedia? What? Um... It's a retrospective of, of a lot of my work. And I have a oh, few cool. pieces there. And we're also doing a listening room for my album, Vortex, which is going to be fun. Um, yeah, just celebrating everything that we've all made as the swarm, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, this individuated swarm of entities that's, you know, been expressed, um, putting it all in one place under one roof, you know, and 
doing different kinds of edits and installations of, of some, some of my films. Nice. So yeah, it's going to be beautiful. But uh, we work, Nora uh, has been working on that with me. It's been, it's curated by Mary Holmes, uh, amazing, you know, uh, curator, founder of Black Star. And I also, know, her, she's been on Film Roundtable. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Most extraordinaire. <laughs> um, and she she brought she connected me with Nora. Um, and and we have been working on that and then worked on Random Max. Um, and are still working on Swarm to finish it in the next few weeks. Um, and yeah, she just built the worlds, you know, she really got in and understood the different layers of reality of the show and, and went to work building it, you know. Um, and all of its naturalism, but then all of its, um, you know, just representing planes of, you know, existence that happen to people and that we experience, but they're hard to like show what they look like as space, you know. So she did a great job with that. And, um, you know, also shout out to our makeup designer, um, Marisha Scott, Marisha Rocks, who is a sister of mine. I mean, we've been rocking together since I don't even know when, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, one of the first people I met when I came to New York for school. Um, and it's just like really channeling through a, um, a specific way of like landing on the face is just like a more expansive palette for expression. You know what I mean? And I think that's very clear in the show. The show just makes use of her, her creativity in a way, you know, like that I, I don't think you really see in cinema a lot of just like allowing the face to be, you know, a really a, a, a play space, you know, for expression and for emotions and, mm. and really going far with, with what that can be. Did she do um, all the black light work? The black she light did stuff? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she did Yeah. Um, yeah, and Sean, of course, you know, um, as my brother, you know, and we're linked on all realms, on all levels, <laughs> you know, so it's like, it's very difficult for me to like phrase exactly what's going on there, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, <laughs> but obviously, I'm just a deep gratitude that is going on that we we found each other, you know, in, in this lifetime. Um, and, you know, in this continuum of, of making work together and expressing through, through our channels, um, you know, and, and also just a big, big shout out to, you know, the editors, um, you know, John Proctor and Kristan, because, you know, the editor of the show is not normal. You know, yeah, you, you would have to come to it with a totally different concept of, you know, your own habits and what you learn works in in the industry. And obviously, you know, essentially their job is to, you know, bring the story out in a certain way, and it's in a in a loose form, so that I can like really finish it and like come in and, you know, put my, you know, clarify it into into what what you know it as when you watch the show, but like they're kind of root work, like working on the roots, you know, of the tree and making sure it's like set up for me to do that, you know, is is, is not easy, you know, um, and they have to do it very quickly with, you know, no real time um, to, to do that. So it's a really commendable job, um, you know, to what they've done with both seasons. Um, as editors and yeah all the writers all the directors you know um just amazing people all all the writers are directors in fact <laughs> so you know uh, it's, it's a special show in that way that like it's it's all filmmakers you know what i mean as opposed to just people who are very specialized you know as writers and directors you know think about mariama for instance or naima um, Nana Mensa, whose film, first film just came out, Queen of Glory, you know, Darius Clark Monroe, Nelson Vandela, my brother, and... you know, 
Who'd you say? Jen. Jen. I loved her episode. Yeah. Yeah. I really felt like her. Yeah. Do a time of Bonomo. You know, all these these people have these like really expansive practices of their own films, you know? Mm -hmm. And they come and they 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 come into the flow of random acts and sort of as an act of service to it, you know, is is definitely not the biggest check in the world, you know. <laughs> but but it's gonna get bigger next 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 time. But you know, they come to they to, they come to really like play, you know, um, and it's a band, you know what I mean? So they come um, with their heart, right? Yeah. I mean, that's why they're doing it. Yeah. And, right. and uh, Andy Thomas Wong, who did episode four. Um, <laughs> my first time working with him, actually, he was like kind of the only person that kind of came into the situation. And he just, you know, he's a big hero of mine, you know. Um, and, you know, obviously, Naima, who wrote, directed, and edited on the first season. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, her understanding of it. So it's like that that energy of like totally new people and people who are like foundational, I think was, was really, really amazing on this season. Um, you know, and I, I would be remiss if I did not mention Alicia Pilgrim, you know, who plays Naja. Mm -hmm. Just a revelation, you know what I mean? Like she was cast very late in the process into quite possibly one of the most complex roles that you could ever attempt to take on. You know, she has to sing, she has to dance, she has to be on many planes of existence, you know. Um, How did you find her? Auditioning, um, shout out to our, our uh, casting director, Susan Shopmaker, mm. who Great in the first season and the second season just brought us a lot of great talent around, around New York. Um, fresh faces, and she was one of those fresh faces. And, um, you know, she, she has a spiritual grounding, you know, she's grounded in her people. Um, and that comes through, you know, like that clarity and that groundedness. And, um, you know, just brought so much to the, to the role, so much that I couldn't have imagined, you know, when writing it, so. Just, just, I'm still really grateful for that experience, her performance, you know. Yeah, she really embodied it, you know, because the dialogue is not easy. And she <laughs> just, of it, she really just, it was coming from her. Like it was, you know, you really felt it. And, um, you know, and just, I, I don't know, all of the aspects of her wounds that she was feeling and healing and, and the way she was moving in the world, the way that two of you, talk together or she and um what's her other partner's name vincent no what's his xavier. what's huh xavier. Vincent, xavier xavier yeah i mean just the just the conversations and um i mean her act her acting was just amazing and she's beautiful i mean she's like mm -hmm. so gorgeous mm -hmm. on camera i'm sure she's gorgeous in person too but she just is gorgeous on camera and yeah she was incredible i was like who is this woman <laughs> Was she doing like theater before? Had she been on yeah. television? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's also in um, A.B. Rockwell's film that just came out, just one Sundance. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so. Nice. Get on board. <laughs> yeah, she's having out. a nice little moment, huh? Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, the, I thought the casting was really interesting. Oh, you know, we just lost Terrence. Lost Terrence for a second. Okay. <laughs> um but all right well should we uh let's see if he comes back in but i do also want to commend you do you how much you must have been holding um to to hold that space for terrence to do what he wanted to be doing while also meeting the needs of your financiers you know or those who trust yeah you. <laughs> and, and i'm not going to pretend that that's uh an easy challenge <laughs> it's also super stressful you know um but it, it's one that i understand is needed a task and again it's not coming from a place of people heart not being in the right place i think across all the partners everybody was in it for the same reasons you know they believed in terrence's voice 
they believed in his vision, but, you know, the circumstances made it where we had to, you know, deliver in such a way that didn't always give the, the, the space for the artistic process to happen. Yeah. You know, it, it, it was many nights and weekends sort of trying to figure out the best way to navigate that and negotiate it. Um, but, you know, again, we were able to deliver a second season. Um, yeah. And I think, again, the goal is always to try to, in some way, um, be measured by the critical acclaim and sort of the impact culturally that we have, um, bring in a different type of audience. Um, and, and when you are that, you have to have the level of patience as people discover it and rediscover it. But mm -hmm. at the core of it, it's just, it's important for me. You know me, Aaron, just in my career that I never sacrifice the, mm -hmm. the end of the day about, you know, the artistic, the artistic part of it but also deliver so that we can get up and do it again. <laughs> right. And also the, just the level of trust that must exist between you and HBO, because you've been doing this a while now and, and they trust you. Like you, you, they know you're going to bring something to the finish line that is going to um, do all of those things that you just said, like bring the creative accolades and bring in an audience that is going to feel really seen and heard by a show like this and 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 all of that is so important you know especially for entertainment companies to be listening what you know unheard audiences haven't had an opportunity to be heard before you know and they're seeing now seeing um content that is speaking to a, just a, a different audience, right? Just on a creative level, on a spiritual level. Um, and I think that's that's really great that they can trust you to bring, you know, to do that with Terrence. Yeah, that's why I mean, just to get back in the booth with him. And, and... Yeah. I mean, I already know because I know, um, Terrence, we were just talking about just bringing what it looks like for us to get back in the booth at some point, you know, and look, I know already certain things that are percolating and, you know, that we're not maybe at liberty to discuss yet, but again, um, I know that I know what I'm going to task Terrence with, you know, again, it started out with like with random acts of flyness. It came me asking him with his version of the news. It's not a news show, but that's sort of where, we started and I know how to act it in such a way that he gave a response we were able to jam on, you know. Again, whatever project we do next may, again, not come from a germ of an idea. It could be source material. It could be something that's personal to him or more just in case, you know, I have a prompt in my back pocket that I'm, I'm eager at some point to, <laughs> to challenge him with. But, you know, again, I think it's just a matter of, of time. Nice. All right. Well, it's almost nine. Um, and yeah, just being conscious of time. Are you guys feeling complete? So the night yeah. off. Thank you so weekend. much. Yeah. Appreciate you. Send me that book. I will. I will. I will. And so good to see you both uh, on yeah. face, face to face. <laughs> on Zoom. <laughs> Thank you. Same here. I mean, like, it's always great chatting with, with the two of you. So anytime I get to jump on and do it, it's a pleasure. Yeah. And, Ter and uh, Tamir, you're in, are you back and forth? Are you in New York mostly or? I, I am mostly in New York, but I'm bi-coastal. So I fly out to LA at least once a month. Oh, okay. All right. Well, let, we should have lunch. Yes. Or, yes. I'm have... around until the end of February. Okay. Um, I'm also, uh, in my own cave, finishing a script that I wrote. So oh, um, good for you. Yes, I'm excited. It's a grounded sci fi. Awesome. Wow. I'm sure it's going to be amazing. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to, uh, to get it out there in the world. Good. Good for you. Nice. All right. Uh, People. Appreciate you. Yeah. All you right. Well, have a great night. Congratulations. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.